Eat to me, Eric. That was my best Wario voice. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I did very well. Uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about isolation levels in this video. Uh, I just want to briefly describe uh, what the difference between locking and row versioning isolation levels. Uh, if I seem a little sleepy, it's because I just ate lunch and I'm like, like a, just like a bear full of salmon right now. Uh, anyway, <laughs> promise will be very lively in a moment. As soon as that fish oil kicks in, you see, you see my skin start to glow and my hair get shiny. Uh, all 23 hours of, of the beginner content is up and, up and running and out there for you to start learning from. Uh, it is all available at the pre-sale price of $250. And that this all this content is going to double in value after the summer when the advanced material uh, drops out of my head. So I would, again, encourage you to buy early and save yourself some money. All right. Let's talk about isolation levels. Uh, in SQL Server, isolation levels can be broadly defined in uh, as locking, row versioning, and of course, read uncommitted. Uh, the locking isolation levels are read committed, repeatable read, and serializable. And the row versioning isolation levels are read committed snapshot isolation and snapshot isolation. And then we have this uncategorized mo mess, this monster, uh, read uncommitted which is a synonym for no lock, right? No lock and read uncommitted, same thing. They do not, there's no difference uh, except where you write them. Still take schema locks and um, it will read data from uncommitted transactions, commonly referred to as dirty reads. This is the one that you generally want to avoid, uh, though most of you have done a quite a poor job failing grades on avoiding read uncommitted slash no lock. So for the locking isolation levels, uh, the locking isolation levels work directly with data and tables and indexes by acquiring shared or exclusive locks as data is read. Uh, that's an important thing to understand because uh, like the, the locks don't occur like in mass, right? Like I guess you could specify like a tab lock hint or something and have SQL Server just be like, no, but under most circumstances, you read something you like, like as you read data, the locks are acquired. Um, you know, even a tab lock hint isn't guaranteed to be able to be taken the second you say to take it because you might have competing locks that would prevent it. Uh, read queries under locking isolation levels might be blocked by modification queries while waiting to take their shared locks on rows. They may also block modification queries under certain conditions where shared locks are held until the statement has finished executing. Uh, this is particularly true of serializable and uh, repeatable read, but it is also quite definitely true under read committed. Read queries can indeed block write queries. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will have examples of that uh, later. Depending on the strictness of the locking isolation level, uh, shared locks may either be held again until the statement is finished or very quickly released because you know, like, like read committed, you're just kind of like chewing along. You take your read lock, you take your little shared lock, you get whatever data you need, whether it's rows or, you know, pages, and then you let the, let the, let that shared lock go and you carry on. Uh, both repeatable read and serializable will hold those shared locks to prevent modifications from modifying data that they have already read. So uh, that doesn't mean that they look, they're not really like looking forward and trying to like, you know, jump ahead to take locks, but as they read data, um, then that's when that, that all goes down. The row versioning isolation levels are a little bit different. Um, the row versioning isolation levels will read copies or versions of locked, row, of locked rows, uh, which can of course result in fewer detrimental blocking and deadlocking scenarios. Uh, I, you know, I, well, I am a, a big proponent of the row versioning isolation levels, you know, especially all of you SQL server people out there who are fawning over Postgres, who, who just can't wait to leave SQL server and get over to Postgres land. Uh, Postgres uses multi-version concurrency control by default, which is a row version, which for that, which means row versioning. Right, except they do it in the worst way possible and they keep all their versions in the table and you have to clean that up. You have to vacuum that mess up. So you're going to have a whole new set of problems once you 
get over to uh, your free database. But the, the like, you know, just to understand in, in SQL Server, though the implementation of the uh, row versioning isolation levels, I believe is far superior, it's still not for free, right? Because you have to version the rows, you have to read from uh, potentially large stores of version rows, uh, even queries that just have to go and check to see if there are like versions of rows that they might have to go read, that's not free. Adding eight byte pointers to your rows so that you can follow the version stuff, that's not free, right? So like there's a lot of stuff that's still not free about it. Even though it's better, it's still not free. But uh, I think the non-locking isolation levels, the row versioning isolation levels, are generally better and less troublesome than your, than your locking alternatives. And I think that the very easy way to tell that this is true, at least in the context of SQL Server, we're not, we're not talking about Postgres anymore, is consider that by default, SQL Server uses read committed locking as its, def as its isolation level. Uh, this is, of course, different if you use Azure SQL Database. Azure SQL Database uses read committed snapshot is isolation by default, but you can turn it off. Um, but nearly every single application I see, nearly every query that someone sends me to say, hey, you know, what's going on with this thing, is just absolutely festooned with no lock hints, right? It's no lock everywhere. Um, it, it's it, it, like, the, like people have such a hard time with read committed the locking default isolation level that they're like, screw it, I'd rather have wrong results than deal with this, right? Just no lock hints every year. There's years of warnings about the perils of no lock, like, you know, everything that people have, like all the blog ink and blood that has been spilled and drank and spilled again, uh, you, you can't keep people away from it. It's like, it's, it is the, one of the most toxic re database relationships that I have ever seen in my life. And, you know, like I said, also like consider that when it came time for Microsoft to offer uh, SQL Server to the world, like, but they were hosting it, they were managing it. They're like, we're in charge. We can do this right. <laughs> we have separate subject, but uh, they at least got this part right. And they were like, no, like, like we're, we're hosting that. You know what we don't want to deal with? A bunch of stupid reader, writer blocking and deadlocking. Like this is this is so annoying. Like, why would anyone want to deal with this? And like, meanwhile, they're like that's what they've been forcing the general public to deal with for the last like thirty something years, right? When I mean, Microsoft got their hand, they're like, nah, we got better things to do. So they made the default isolation level read committed snapshot isolation. So a lot of this is just to set the stage for some somewhat simpler statements, and uh, we're actually going to close this one out here. Uh, under row versioning isolation levels, read queries are not blocked by write queries. They go and read uh, versions of the rows, copies of the rows that are locked. Uh, also, read queries do not block write queries. Another good thing, right? It's, it's almost it's like using no lock, but better because there are no dirty reads. Uh, and also, deadlocks do not occur between read queries and write queries. There are, of course, some edge cases and caveats to that where uh, that like complicate those statements a little bit, like things like you know uh, foreign key cascading, uh, maintaining uh, index views uh, that have multiple tables in them, do weird stuff to the row versioning isolation levels. But those are like kind of out there edge cases, and not like everyday stuff that's going to be happening to you like every three seconds in your database that's going to make you use no lock hints. Under the locking isolation levels, read queries can and, and are quite frequently blocked by write queries. Read queries can also uh, be blocked by write queries. And deadlocks can occur between read queries and write queries. So there is, uh, there is a lot bad to be said about the, um, about the default situation in SQL Server. I think that had Microsoft made a better choice uh, back in, say, 2005, when the, uh, the row versioning isolation levels were introduced to the world, perhaps not to say that all of your databases are now going to be using a row versioning isolation level, but perhaps to say that any new databases will by default be using a row versioning isolation level, but you can turn it off if you want, sort of like with Azure, like Azure SQL database. You, it, it's on by default, but you can opt out of it. I think SQL Server would be in a much shinier, happier place than it is today where people still have all sorts of unwarranted fears and misconceptions about row versioning isolation levels, perhaps from reading terrible blog posts about them that involve 
marbles and whatnot. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. And I will see you in the next video where we will talk about, uh, I forget, but it's still transactions and isolation level. So it'll be a good time because that's what we do here. We have a good time. If you can't have a good time, what can you have? Nothing. All right. Thank you for watching.